In that time, um, we've actually, I've developed myself quite a bit from just being here, learning from other people, from people, our members, from other uh, co-workers. <clears throat> and that learning process is continuous, as you all know. Uh, it, it just never never stops. You always learn something new, and you pick up ideas from other folks. What I'd like to do before I start is provide you a little video. It's a, but I think it's an inspirational type video. Not you don't like it. Uh, it reminds me of us, actually, it should remind all of us of why we're here, our purpose for, for doing what we do now. And I, I hope you like it. You might have seen it before, but uh, it's something that we show during our uh, three-day supervisor program for, for school members. So let me uh, just play that for you real quick here. <clears throat> like that video? Yes. Is it something that uh, you would show to your uh, employees, or your members? We did about three days ago, I think. Did you? Yeah, we attended one of the webinars for the last. Did you, how did it go? Oh, well, it was okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we had some technical issues, but that's oh, okay. <laughs> that. um, You know, it, it's something that you can try out. Um, people get tired of seeing the same thing over and over. And, um, 
we actually experience the same issue you all do probably. We have over 2,600 members in our school, and we work with them and probably help them uh, improve their, you know, their losses. Uh, and it's an ongoing, you know, it's an ongoing process. You you may say something to them one day, and then a year later or two, somebody else might replace that person or that entire staff. So you kind of have to start all over again. You know, you know what I'm saying. So it's, it's actually a continuous process. You're always having to repeat yourself, but you don't want to bore yourself or you don't want to bore them either. So you want to make sure that they understand what we're doing is important. And I was just, uh, this morning I was talking to one of my members that I service in the area, and she was telling me a story that actually just happened. Um, and it all came back to something that we initiated with them, and they took the, you know, they took the lead in it. And when they had it corrected, they actually saved a life um, at a swimming pool. It was, uh, this morning, I think it was, or uh, yesterday, another gentleman was at the swimming pool, the city's swimming pool, and he started having a heart attack. And just last summer, I had gone to that member, we had talked about uh, training, you know, going over their CPR, going over their in service uh, training. And sure enough, um, they were doing it, but not as frequently as we would like to see it. So this morning, I, I heard this good news. They well, because of what you told us, you know, you encouraged us, we actually started doing more training, and that training came in very handy yesterday. We saved a life. You know, and those are the kind of things that we like to hear. We don't hear that probably often enough, but we do hear them, and that makes our job so much easier to do, we get more, get motivated, we want to do it more. And I hope that's what you all, you know, actually, you know, want to do as well. But uh, this section and prevention plan, uh, how many of you remember the TWCC? You all you'll remember that? Uh, there are now, of course, TDI, um, uh, DWC, correct? Yes. Um, i um, the accident prevention plan, for those of you have been around for a while, was something that uh, the state, uh, TWCC, uh, put together. Um, and I was there at the beginning, back in 92 when I got here in Austin. I had just retired from the Air Force, and they were hiring all these inspectors um, to go out and, and you know, spread the good news, so, so to speak. And I was one of the inspectors. Uh, the accident prevention plan, um, was something that was formulated, developed to basically suit up most employers, any kind of industry you would probably fit in. And um, it's actually seven components, and mostly it was it was stuff for people with what we called at that time extra hazardous employer. You all remember that the extra hazardous employer program, uh, where a, a company, an employer had more injuries than they were expected to have. So we would come in and uh, help those employers. And one of these we used was the accident prevention plan. Well, when I came to TML, risk pool, we had a safety program, but that plan was not in the program. So we kind of started developing it, put it in there, and used it so, so much because it actually does work. Members that use it, uh, and other things use it, they actually do decrease their claims experience. And we've seen it work over and over again. That's why we still use it. It's an old, old school type thing, but it does work. Uh, we just refine it, we use other resources, we use technology, as you saw. Uh, we have, now we have iPads, of course, and uh, some of my co workers back here, uh, Jimmy Hawkins and uh, Ronnie Sexton. Um, well, you know, we'll, let, we'll tell you the same thing we, that I'm telling you. We're always developing, we're always changing, trying to keep up, you know, <laughs> with everything that comes up. So, but the actual, the, uh, let me see if I can get this up here. The actual version plan is a very simple, really, a simple concept, but not simple to implement sometimes, especially if you have resistance. Um, what you see up here 
It's a, uh, the, something that we just came up maybe six months ago. It's a law prevention toolbox, and all our resources, because we have quite a few, as you can see, everything that we have is now in this little jump drive. Okay? This little bitty thing here um, makes it accessible to our members, everything that we offer them. So they can't say, well, I, I, I lost it, I can't find it, I gotta go here, I gotta go there. Well, now they can just click on any of these topics. Uh, for example, we have, now we have webinars. They can go down there and click on the webinar and it will bring it up. We have recorded webinars and we have live webinars, but they'll all be found there. If they want to look at a uh, internet learning, which we also have online learning, uh, we have that as well. So it's all at their fingertips, so to speak. It's everything is right here for them. And I'll, I can't give you, if you're not a member of the risk pool, I can't give you one of these, I'm sorry. But because some of this stuff, you won't have access to anyway. But I will give you the, uh, a copy of the uh, sample safety plan that I'll be covering with them here in a few minutes. So we, we came up with this idea, hoping that everything is there, you know, everything is in one place. Uh, if they lose it, we can replace it, but uh, it, it's, and you all know what a account product is, right? I mean, it's, it's all technology now. <laughs> it's, you know, it's been around for a while. Uh, it's replaced a lot of the CDs and things like that. But we're, we're always trying to improve our services to our members. And in case you don't know who our members are, these are mostly cities, they are housing authorities, uh, water districts, emergency service uh, districts, um, tax districts. We even have transits uh, in, our, in our risk pool. Uh, the largest, of course, is the Capital Metro here in Austin. But we do have uh, the uh, transit in Corpus Christi and some other areas in Texas. So we're spread out. I mean, we're coming over the place. And that makes our fun, our job, you know, fun, interesting sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it is a challenge. But um, at any time that you all, my uh, co-workers, want to jump in, feel free. No? Now they're being shy. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ronnie Saxon is actually back there. Well, the one with the, the most hair, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ronnie Saxon is our, one of our trainers. And uh, last week, um, we did a, a training program in Yolkham three-day program for supervisors and um, those folks were so appreciative of us being there that they couldn't do enough for us. When we left, they were still trying to ask, can we help you, you know, because this training that we provide, it's not just training, you know, it's, it's training that we've developed because we found that it is a need for it. We found supervisors are, are many times not enforcing the rules, not doing their job. So supervision, Right now, to us, it's a big, big target area. We actually focus on that very much. Um, obviously, we can't do that for all our members. It is a three-day commitment. But we have other training that we provide. Uh, we have videos. We have a, a three-hour program for supervisors. But uh, So right now, we're focusing a lot on supervision. And I'll show you here in a minute why that's so important. Any questions so far? Anybody have anything? I'm going to do a, a Marco, Marco Rubio. Was that, is that a senator from Florida? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> take a little sip of water. Um, I have allergies, and this week has been horrible for me because of the wind noise and the dry conditions. So I hope you don't mind. Sorry about that. But anyway, let me get to the. Uh, so the actual presentation. The programs that you have, we can download those and then manipulate them, change data, put in pictures, things of that nature. <coughs> these, these would be uh, the programs, the PowerPoints. They're PowerPoints, so you can pretty much work with them. You know. um, Brian. I need your help. <laughs> it's not coming up. I'm trying to open this. 
Hey, you know, well, you're just working. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you get a, you had a basic touch. Yeah, these programs are PowerPoint programs, so you can you know change slides, put some more, take up, you know, make customize to what you want to do. In fact, uh, this uh, safety program, we decided to where um, the member can make changes because not every member has the same operation, obviously. Uh, so some things may not apply, and there are other things that they have to add to it or take out. And so this makes it very convenient for them to work with. So do you sort of mirror the OSHA codes and regs with this? Or I'm sorry? Do you mirror the OSHA codes and regs, which we're not subject to? <laughs> yes, uh, you don't see a lot of references similar to OSHA, obviously. Um, is that what you're asking, OSHA? Correct. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to comply with OSHA being a municipality, but we do have to follow those certain rules, um, especially in very dangerous uh, occupations like uh, when there's trenching or confined spaces. We do actually teach OSHA. We don't say it's OSHA, but yeah. this OSHA obviously you know, can't get away from it, obviously. So, um, and that's something that, that Ronnie uh, does for us uh, on site. Okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, you see a map here with all these uh, different names on. Okay. Oops. I show. Can show the map, right? But, uh, that should be a map. Well, anyway, you already know who I am. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, and, and while I'm here, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, risk management process. How many risk managers do we have here? One, two, three, okay. Uh, some of you already might have heard this before, um, but it's something that we need to really uh, talk to our members about, to every employee, what they understand what their risk management process is, so they can, they can actually be involved in it. And uh, we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. And of course, we're going to talk about the uh, the seven components. So why do we want to develop a safety plan? The, the reason is obvious. You know, we have people getting hurt every day. Uh, just this morning I, I heard about a, uh, uh, the silos where they, they store you know, uh, the grain where young people as, as young as 14 have lost their lives because they, they're put in there not known what they're doing, they just throw them in there and clean it up. Next thing they, you know, they're in the grain, they get you know, pretty much sucked in. And once you get sucked in, it's, it's, you don't come out, you don't come out alive. Um, and these things are still happening. Why do they happen? Obviously, there's a lot of reasons, uh, mainly because people that hire them don't really care that much about their safety of the employees. And, I mean, it has been an ongoing battle for years and years. That's why OSHA was put together many years back to put these standards and regulations in place. But as you all know, you all hear it every day. Somebody falls out of a building. Um, somebody gets uh, trapped in a confined space or a trench caves in. In fact, we have um, an incident that happened not long ago where <coughs> We had an employee uh, working in the trench, uh, 10 foot down, and with no shoring. Now, if you all know what shoring equipment is, mm -hmm. right? It basically it keeps the, the wall from falling in. It's, it's, uh, so when we investigated, we found out that uh, they didn't have the shoring equipment. They said, well, why not? No, we can't afford it. Very simple answer, we can't afford it. So we just had the employees in there and, they do what you gotta do, fix that leak, uh, repair that service line, and hopefully get out of there alive. Well, we talked to them and said, well, if you can't afford the equipment, what you can do is you can contract somebody that does have the equipment to come in and do the work for you. Or you can rent the equipment when you need it, because they don't use it all the time, obviously. So I mean there are options, but people either don't have the money, don't have the time to you know to do deal with it, but whatever reason they have, and obviously somebody gets hurt. So it is still a challenge, and we're it's an ongoing challenge, 
and something that we uh, need to keep doing because that's our job. And we, we have to remind them. Um, all these things keep popping up. Okay. So obviously, the purpose of a plan is to protect your your employees, protect the uh, the public you serve. And if you don't feel that passion, compassion for that, you're not going to do a great job because you don't really feel it, right? Uh, and you're just going to go through the, through the you know, routine, through the steps. And we're trying to get away from that. It, it's important. It really is important that we do our job to keep everybody safe. So even before you start a plan, think about that. You know, why are you doing it? What are your exposures out there? Who, who are you trying to protect? And from what? Okay, so it's very important you know that. Obviously, um, management has to be committed to it. If you don't have the support of management, nothing's going to happen, right? If you don't get the funding from them. They said if they don't think it's important, nothing's going to happen. So we need their management support. This is probably one of our biggest challenges, especially with a bigger city where they have a lot of employees. And how do you get the word out to the employees? Well, we had a city not too long ago in the valley um, that uh, we got involved with. Um, we have a process, another program that we call the discovery team process. You know, Jimmy, right, you've been in it? Yeah. Uh, the discovery team process is aimed at employers, mostly cities that we have, with way too many too many injuries. I mean, we're just like you know, way beyond what the other members are experiencing. So what we do is we get these team team together. We go out and meet with them. We do, we, do, we meet with all the all the department heads, all the supervisors, city managers, the city managers and all. And we tell them, hey, this is all your long. We sit there, we actually spend about three days with them. And then we go break out and, and actually go to each department that's having those claims, those, those uh, losses. And we, we talk to them. We don't actually tell them, hey, we just talk to them and ask them questions. And they, they tell us what's going on. And it's not a, a voluntary, on a voluntary basis. We've noticed that we're taking this approach, this voluntary approach, just actually going out and showing them that we do care and we do want to help them has resulted in a lot, a lot of uh, let, a lot less losses. But one city took it really very seriously and they met with all their employees. I mean, they had everybody in there. How they did it, I don't know. But they just had a few out there that were you know, performing the basic services. And they told them, they went through the whole plan, they told the employees that this is what we're going to do. And if you're not familiar with the city, when the city manager says something, that's what's going to happen. You know, he is the honcho, the big guy, you know, city manager. So when you have somebody like that supporting you, they're going to listen, they're going to do what is asked of them. And uh, that's the way it worked for Jimmy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Jimmy and I have uh, been uh, to several of these discovery team visits, <clears throat> mostly because uh, some of them were in the valley, some of them are uh, other places. So but employees need to be involved. All the employees need to be involved. Does yes. the municipality have to have a certain IR incident rate in order to qualify to have you come up for that? What, yes, sir. Uh, what we do as far as the discovery team? Uh -huh. yes. Uh, what we do is we actually look at all our members and their bosses and, and go to those ones that have, like I said, way too many. So that's something you initiate, not something that I as a safety guy would call and say, hey, look, I'd like you to tweet. Oh, right, right. No, actually, uh, it's more of a team effort. Uh, we have a gentleman, uh, one of our law prevention reps, uh, he's a uh, uh, giant. He's, uh, Actually, the one that developed this for us, and I mean, used to be my rep. Yes, Aaron Johnny, and he's uh, a little guy, he's about six, six five. <laughs> um, he's the one that actually 
pass into this, you know, this uh, system, and um, it works well, it works great. Uh, but we do our selecting of who will go see. And they have to be willing, it's voluntary. Yeah. We ask them, we don't tell them where we're coming from, it's all voluntary. Uh, so we don't push it on anybody, we just tell them what the benefits of the program are. And so far, nobody has turned us down. <laughs> Hey, Carlos, uh, if, if I might interject, uh, yes, well, please. I'm, I'm James Hoskins, I'm one of the reps. With gentlemen's asking, typically we do focus on what we call our top 200 members in the risk pool, but my suggestion would be is talk to your loss prevention rep, look at your losses and see where you stand, and then, you know, yeah, we, have, we haven't had anybody come and say, come do it for us. Yeah, see, but, ours are real low now, right. but I'm a dedicated But system. that's why you want to keep it low, right, I understand. Right. And, and typically, though, we look more at the problem child, excuse the phrase, but that's what we typically look at. But work with the rep, you're from where, Houston, right? No, from Friendswood. Friendswood, yeah, yeah okay. You're in Carolina. Like you're in Carolina. Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. It used to be urban, but then. Right. Right. It's well, great that he doesn't know who you are. I was, well, I knew his face because I was in a city doing property about three years No, I just mean that he must not be a problem child. Yeah, no. <laughs> but, then, you know, but my suggestion is, if for anybody here in the pool is, yeah, talk to your rep and look at your losses and then we'll see what we can do. But mostly, we've tried to focus more on the cities that have really high losses to try to help them to reduce their losses. So that's kind of where, that's what we're looking at. The reason I'm asking, the, the main thing I'm looking at right now, because I, I may look to move on eventually, right. is sort of dynasty building. Right now, we don't have a written program right. on the program. Right. Right. So if I if I go, then my knowledge and my books and everything goes with you. Yeah. I need to sit well, that's what this, this, this thing right here, here the safety plan, that's yeah. something that, that I think like Carolyn can get a copy to you if you don't get one here today. But yeah, it's, it's primarily, you know, sorry, Carl's not to interrupt, but, but if you are a city where, say, you may have to be a city that you, your losses are not great, you know, they're not like, we've looked at some that like their loss ratio was over 100%. So that's the one that we've kind of focused yeah. on going in on. But if you have a higher loss ratio, you know, there might be some talk where we could, we could come out and try to do it. But it is a lot of time and effort to get to it. That's the thing. So. I'll touch bases with Kyle. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Appreciate it. So are you going to try and call us? No. Okay. <laughs> I, we wouldn't <laughs> warn at this point. I might hurt a few people just so I can get you in. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a very good program. It worked very well for all of them. Uh, um, there are a lot of components that actually are mentioned. The only components that you all see, that's something we do based on what we find our, our um, survey findings and our conversation with the employees. So it is a long, long drawn process, but it's very, very helpful. And uh, sometimes they fall behind on some of the recommendations, but we just keep going back. Making sure that it's just working for you all, it's just what you all want. Uh, so we kind of revisit, you know, with the member. Again, it's very important that you have the support of management. You know, otherwise, it won't go anywhere. Uh, again, you see the same slide. Every employee is part of the risk management team. What does that mean? Well, every employee is responsible for certain things and I'll get to it in a minute, they have to follow the rules. But if they don't know what the rules are, you know, they're gonna make up their own rules, right? If you, don't, if you don't have a policy, and you allow an employee to do something in a certain way, that is the policy, right? You're telling them, if you don't, by, not, by you not telling them it's not fine, they're saying, okay, well, they're letting me do this, so I guess it's okay, right? So we have to have policies, and employees have to know what those policies are, those procedures. Uh, otherwise, they're going to do whatever they can, how they can do it, with whatever they have. Just like that employee in the trench. Hey, you know, it's fine for me, I've been doing this forever. And next thing you know, uh, one year, one day, one year, nothing happens. Like we just we saw uh, a week ago. Okay, here, here's a little chart. You've probably seen something like this before. You, you've probably seen it um, on the risk management process. Um, this chart is, is sounds like it's kind of, you know, kind of boring to look at. You know, it's, oh yeah, I've kind of seen that before, you know, old pie chart and steps. But really, 
what this shows you is, is the basics of, of risk management. Uh, risk identification, what does that mean? Analysis. Uh, we, in, in a risk pool, in a loss prevention department, are always, like I said, we're always trying to identify the risks that our employees, that are our members face. And when we communicate with them what, what that means, is we tell them, okay, well, risk, management, risk identification means inspections. When you do an inspection, what do you see out there that might hurt you or the public? Okay. That's one way of, of identifying risk through an inspection process or program. What do you inspect? What do you all inspect? Do you all have any inspections? What do you inspect? Uh, everything and anything. We do a site inspection every year where yeah. fire marshals walk through each and every facility. Right. Okay. And just critique the facility. We actually do what I call a job hazard analysis on specific right. high risk jobs. Mm -hmm. And the supervisors, I help them with that. We okay. make sure that all the employees are trained on that. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, in this program that we provide, this uh, safety program, we have an entire checklist of things to look for facilities vehicles, equipment, um, and by equipment I mean heavy equipment, uh, other equipment that they use out there for special tests, like for uh, electrical utility um, work, those high lifts, I mean everything that I think probably have, we probably have an inspection checklist or something they can look at to inspect that equipment, that facility. We also, one thing that we always, always point out, wherever we go, is housekeeping. Any idea why you think housekeeping is that important? Anybody have any idea? I don't want to monopolize <laughs> Housekeeping is important for all kinds of areas, mainly slips, trips, and falls. Exactly. exactly. Housekeeping is probably one of the most overlooked areas of uh, risk identification. We have. <laughs> And I'm sure our, my coworkers will agree. We have seen just about everything we can imagine. We'll go to a city and we'll see something, for example, a tool that somebody uses on a regular basis. Okay, it's, it's stored on the wall, it's hanging on the wall. But to get to it, you have to jump over hoops. Basically, you know, there's there's wire, there's supplies on the floor, there's a tube. There's all kinds of things just to get to that piece of equipment or a ladder, whatever it is. So what happens, slips and falls, strains from trying to reach over. And housekeeping is such a simple thing to maintain and yet it's not always done. No. So we always, always focus on housekeeping because it's such a simple thing that the member can, can fix. They can, they can see it, they can fix it once we bring it to their attention. So that's one way of identifying risk. Another way of identifying risk or uh, exposures is something that after something happens. You don't want to wait till then, but that's usually what happens. There's an accident, somebody gets hurt, you say, well, what happened? So you start looking into it, and sure enough, it was this, what was that, and it was a risk there all the time, but nobody ever noticed it before. You know that stuff. <laughs> So that's another way of identifying risk. Employees themselves are at risk. And only because sometimes they can't really do the job that they're assigned to do. They're not prepared physically, mentally. They have not big training, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, so you have to identify those things that might hurt them before they even get out there. Again, the safety manual that we have uh, has all types of policies and procedures that you can follow that will help them stay safe. Uh, and I can go on and on, but yes, are you like this? No, okay. Um, and I'll, follow, I'll just go through these a little bit further, but uh, <coughs> I don't want to watch them right now. Okay. Um, we talk about analysis, which you, of, of course, you always analyze your losses through loss rooms, which we provide to our members. Basically, a lot of around is just a report with all the claims information on there. 
who got hurt, when they got hurt, uh, how they got hurt, what were they doing. And uh, I know somebody here that I see quite often, that they see me come in and say, uh oh, what do we have today? And uh, I'll show the list of claims and, and we talk about it. Um, uh, we had uh, one member who uh, had a lot of claims in the animal control department. And I said, well, what's going on with the animal control department? And I mean, that's, that's, they weren't serious injuries, but they were just a lot of them. And uh, so she and I, the risk manager, started looking at these claims. We went over there and talked to the folks and kind of surmised that they weren't doing everything that they could do <laughs> to, to protect themselves. So <clears throat> it's kind of funny in a way because have you ever worked with people that, that work with animals, like a veterinarian, or they're very, they're very, you know, passionate about their work, and they care about the animals that they work with. So we went over there and talked to them. and said, "Well, I said, you, can you all wear gloves when you handle the animals?" Said, well, no, because that the cats don't like that. I said, what do you mean the cats don't like it? Well, you know, they like to feel the, the human touch. We can control them better by by the human you know, touch that they feel from us. <laughs> and they said, well, okay. So we looked at the, somebody else, well, the risk manager looked at the, at the gloves that are available, and there actually are gloves that will protect the outside of the hand and still allow the touch you know, to be felt by the animal, the cat, uh, they they are handling. So there, there's always a way you know, to, to, to make things safer. And that's just one example, um, but um, you know, you can't just say, well, we do that, that's how we do it. That's all, we always done it that way. There's always a way to do it better or safer. Um, anyway, let me uh, <coughs> go here. Okay. So basically, uh, the risk management process is identifying risks, uh, taking action to correct those, and then one thing that never seems to fail is once you put an action into place, once you make a corrective action, it's always important to monitor to see how those things are working out. Okay, you can't just drop it and say, "Okay, well we fix that problem." You have to go back and make sure it is still working, and then the uh, recommendations you have in place. The procedures have in place are still more good and effective because things can change. All right. Okay, here we go. This is basically what we give our uh, our members. Uh, I don't know if you can read that up there, but it says uh, the document was developed to assist members of the risk pool with the development of a safety and energy prevention program. It is designed to be utilized as a guideline or template. Again, you can change it uh, to a certain extent to develop new policies and procedures or enhance current programs that may already be in place. So if somebody has a, a safety process in place already, we're not telling them to get rid of it. We're just telling them, well, now look at this, uh, see if it helps you, and you can use it, great. If you can use the information in there with what you have, that's even better. So that's all we're asking. We're not forcing anything on them. Are we? No. <laughs> uh, again, this is what you will see in the, in the safety manual. Section one is what we're talking about today. Um, section two gets a little more into your return to work programs, uh, respiratory program, confined space, hazard communication. Um, Disciplinary, you see, disciplinary action uh, policy in there, and then section three is where you have really um, basic procedures, specific procedures for any given department, uh, whether it be streets, water, uh, you know, auto, uh, auto utilities. So it's broken down in three sections, and what we'd like to do is, is when we approach the member with this information, we say, okay, let's start with section one. You know, let's start there. And we work our way up, hopefully, eventually they adopt the whole program. 
But again, uh, if, if I don't have the number these for, for you all, I can, if I get an email address for you, I can send it to you. So here are the seven components that uh, I got to. Again, a management safety component, very important to have uh, management support. And that's it, it's an investigation policy. So you can um, investigate the accident and try to prevent it from happening again. And of course, the training, that's probably our biggest resource, the training uh, component. And uh, I'll talk to you more about that in a minute. I might not be able to get to all of these. Uh, yeah, quick question for you on the record keeping. Mm -hmm. I keep getting requests from the Department, I think it's the Department of Labor, asking me to submit any and all incidents and background information on them. And we're not subject to do that. Right, right. Do, do you, should I cooperate and play nice? I've never sent them to <laughs> before because uh, they're not entitled yeah. to anything. You don't have to comply with those requirements, reporting requirements. Um, it does help to gather the information for you know for statistics uh, nationwide. And I've seen where the uh, the zip codes, the old zip codes, um, they go back and reference some of uh, city operation. Is it your first city, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so they actually, it, it is useful to them in getting other uh, like utilities and then utilities. But you don't have to do it. Is there Basically. an ultimate value to me for having done it? Or does that just lead us down the road to eventually somebody comes and wants to regulate us? That, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's always been that, that threat of regulating uh, government agencies uh, such as cities. And, you know, um, there's always been thought about a OSHA, a state OSHA, like California has. Uh, the approach here in Texas, of course, they've always said no, we don't want it. Um, as you know, when the, when the TWCC first started out, we had a lot of things in there that eventually went away because the growers had just not wanted, they didn't want it. Uh, in 92, when I started working with the state, um, they had just, then I accepted the uh, requirement for the workers' comp, you know, and, and still that's only for, for governmental entities. Uh, in Florida, the private industry don't have to have workers' comp uh, coverage, but they're you know, subject to uh, other things if they don't have that. Uh, right. So there's always that possibility, and I can't say it's not going to happen, but it might happen one day, I don't know. Um, been, ever since I can remember, it's been talked about it. It's been talking about it, talking about it, but nothing's happening yet. There's actually legislation written that's not been passed by Woolsey and somebody else. They, yeah. they're, they were mandated in all states that fall under OSHA. And I'll get a much bigger budget if that ever happens, but yeah. you know, right now, there's, we just don't, we don't have the ability to do the documentation that's required. We do all the training. Right. We're very good at the training. Right. But I don't have written programs. That's what the next phase in our evolution is the written program. Because right now the program is me if I leave, there's no program. So we need to have something in writing, but you know, if we can't have somebody else implement it, then and we don't want to. Well, see, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the battle. Yeah, that's exactly what he's, what he's saying is, is very true. Um, as much as we push this uh, to our members, sometimes they just can't do it. Um, lack of resources, lack of employees, uh, just too much in their hands, too much uh, workload. But we don't give up. You know, we still try to encourage them to, to do something, like you know, you're saying. Uh, having a written plan um, is always a good idea. Because if you don't have a written plan, again, I go back to the other thing I would say. If you allow employees to do what they want to do, that's, that's, you're, that's, you're saying that that's our policy, yeah. That's fine. You want to do it that way, that's fine. And that's not what you want to happen. You want to make sure that they're following safe, positive, safe procedures. Okay. Um, does that make sense to anybody? Or is it my complete loss to everybody here? Or does that help you all? <laughs> is that helping it at all? 
And that's up in the tubby so far? Yeah? Okay. Um, I know I have a lot of people that are not risk managers here. Um, I have maybe a, what do I have here? Hey. It might be helpful if you go over the difference between a policy and a procedure. Yeah, okay. Um, Good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have uh, different people from uh, different agencies. Uh, uh, claims adjuster, uh, let's see, director of employee benefits. Um, I don't deal with that much with uh, safety, but maybe, maybe they do. Uh, district manager, um, manager of risk finance. So even though you might not be dealing directly with uh, risk management, if you deal with money, obviously the bottom line does get affected by premiums that go up or to common contributions that go up because of losses from workers' compensation injuries or uh, liability injuries that our members are exposed to. So it does hit the bottom line. Um, that's, we don't want to get into that because that's not what we, that's not our philosophy. I mean, the money is important, of course. Um, but let me give you an example. A really good example of what happened last year. We had an employee um, working at a jackhammer. You all know what a jackhammer is, right? It's like a big old tool that makes holes. Um, he was working with a jackhammer, yeah. and, the, and the jackhammer became stuck in, in, in the pavement. So he couldn't he couldn't undo it. So another employee came by. I said, well, I'll get, I'll get my jackhammer. Okay. I'll, I've got this big old jackhammer I can let you loose. So he brings his jackhammer, his, uh, jackhammer a slash hammer, I'm sorry, slash hammer, and strikes the, uh, the jackhammer with it at the end. Good. If you know what a, jack, a jackhammer looks like, it's like a big old drill bit, right? Well, that drill bit broke. <coughs> a piece as big about that one came flying out and struck the employee right in the eye. Right, I mean, he probably, you know, it just couldn't have been worse. Um, what happened? Uh, obviously, he wasn't wearing heart protection, right? Does the city have a policy to wear heart protection? <coughs> it did, but he was not wearing it. For whatever reason, don't know. That employee went through several surgeries, ups and downs. Oh, it looks good. You might have your eyesight back. Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, to this day, that employee cannot see all that well from that one eye. Okay, he's got reduced vision. Might be even legally blind. Um, he had to go through many through many surgeries. Uh, eye surgery. Uh, I had to uh, put the expense of all that. So, I mean, you know, the suffering that goes with that. Loss of income because obviously workers come, if you lose time, you only get 70% of your income. If you had a part-time job, that's gone because you can't do that. Um, if he drives for the, as a part-time, that's not really an option. Uh, he couldn't do certain, he couldn't bend, he couldn't do a lot of things because any movement would affect the surgery that he had on the eye. All that because why? He didn't wear eye protection. It's something so simple. They could have prevented all that from happening. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it, it, it sounds rather simple, rather plain, like rather boring sometimes, but it does make a difference. You know, if you don't do it, it makes a big difference. We have claims that we like to call career changing injuries. You all know what that means, right? Um, police officer on duty chasing somebody um, in a car, vehicle, they have an accident. 
death is so bad that uh, she has to have her, her leg work no, almost amputated. And this lady, this officer, all she ever wanted to be was a police officer. Can she do that now? No, she can't do it. As much as she wants to do it, she, she can't be a police officer. Again, things change rapidly when you have an accident, a serious injury. And it, it's up to us to, to remind those folks, hey, this is how we can prevent it. You know? um, it, it's, it can be a, a repetitious job, I know. It can be um, discouraging sometimes. Um, but we, we can't give up. We can't, we can't just say, well, I'll forget it. No, we can't do that. Uh, it, it's too important to do that. Um, anyway, <laughs> hey, Roddy, I can't get to the. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get to these. Uh, where's my. I'm not using our own computer, so uh, if I can hear, if I can uh, happen, oops, when we don't have our own equipment uh, <laughs> that we're used to. Um, How much time do I have? About five minutes? Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not going to get through all of this. That's a 10-15. I think I got my message across. So. <sighs> it's not working, but okay. I apologize for this. Uh, Here you see, um, this is something really, uh, I guess it's very, very important uh, when you have safety responsibilities. This is, this is a policy, okay? This is what we're saying everybody's going to do, uh, specific things. Uh, management, you know, provide leadership, direction. Uh, without them, we can't really go anywhere. Uh, enforce safety rules, uh, set goals. Uh, we're going to have zero eye injuries. Why? Because everybody should be wearing their eye protection. Um, those kind of things. Supervisors, going to go back to that example about the eye injury. Uh, were they, was supervisors enforcing the rule? Was that the first time they did not wear their eye protection? Probably not. Why did that happen? Because they said, well, we always do it this way. We don't need eye protection. It definitely never happens. Uh, do not permit new or experienced personnel uh, to work with power tools. Another example, uh, about three or four years ago, right, we had uh, an employee. She was a fairly new employee, uh, worked for the Parks Department. She was told not not to get on the zero, you all know what a, a zero turn radius more is? Yes. So, yeah, those really fast ones, you just kind of, you, you see the guys out there operating those. Uh, they're very, very fast, and you have to be able to operate them, you know, control them. Uh, this employee was not trained on it. She was not authorized to operate it, but it was lunch break, and she wanted to make an impression. Uh, obviously that she could probably do it well everybody was at lunch she was the only one there she got on the moor started using it lost control of it when he took it back went into the water two feet of water she drowned in two feet of water because she couldn't get out of it she, she was stuck nobody was there to help her because nobody knew that she was doing that Training is very, very, very important. If they don't know how to operate the equipment, they shouldn't be on it. They should not be anywhere close to it unless they've been trained. 
um, has, you I don't know, you probably use those more every day. Uh, I have crews that do. Yeah, and they're very fast, very powerful. It's actually the most severe injury we've had was a person cut through the great toe and the next two toes, it tore his steel toe boot out of his foot, out of his shoe. When I did the investigation, the interlocking safety switch that prevents that mower from running when they get off the mower had been disabled on all the devices. The mower was bungeed up, which exposed the blade, and they were mowing when there was about an inch of water standing on the field. Oh, yeah. That should have been one. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, you know, uh, we hate to say it, but we hear these stories all the time. I mean, it's, it's just, it's like continuous, it's never ending. You would think that eventually not, none of these things would happen, but they do. You know, they just keep happening for lack of uh, training, lack of experience, lack of knowledge, lack of caring. Um, but when you have this policy, all this is, should be written out. Everybody should know what their responsibilities are for safety, okay? Uh, there should be no reason why they should not be aware of it. If you have it in writing and you have it um, distributed to all your employees. <clears throat> Again, same thing for employees. Uh, know your job, follow instructions, and think before you go back. Um, not, not talking about workers' comp, we also have a general liability coverage, and sometimes employees are involved in an accident. And the first thing they say, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. The city will pay for it. You know that—that that is the worst thing they can say you know, to to, uh, to anybody. Uh, it might be their fault, but there might be other reasons involved. We might not even cover that type of loss. So employees need to know what to say. You know how to report an injury, what not to say, what to say to to a citizen, uh, to a customer, because not knowing can get you a, a lot of trouble. <laughs> as we uh, we see. Anyway, let me um, get out of this because I know I'm running out of time. And if I didn't cover this, and you want a copy of this, just let, uh, give me a business card.